Welcome to the Beyond Ljubljana podcast. I'm your host, Noah Charney. In each episode, we embark on a journey to discover the hidden gems, captivating stories, and unique experiences waiting to be uncovered. Let's get started. Those of you who are feeling a little more intrepid might be curious to explore beyond that hidden gem known as Ljubljana. So if Ljubljana is a hidden gem, what should we call these little-known aspects of it? Are they hidden or gems? Or I'm going to go with little-known facets of the hidden gem. But while I'm working on that metaphor, let me just run down some places that I like to recommend to friends, even Slovenes who might not have explored them. So the question is, you know, if you've seen what's in Ljubljana, you've seen things that are in most guidebooks, and you want to know, well, where else can I go? What's just beyond Ljubljana that's unlikely to be too crowded on a nice day? Well, I'm happy to send you on a bunch of adventures outside of Ljubljana, but still within the greater Ljubljana area, which means that everywhere I'm sending you is less than a half hour drive away and often much less. And the first one I'll send you to has a legendarily creepy name. It is Peko Gorge or Hell Gorge. When you first drive up, you have to drive past this super cutesy town called Blueberry, Boronica. So it gives you this idea that, you know, you're just going into the sweetest, most Norman Rockwelly hinterlands outside of Ljubljana, is this teacup capital of Slovenia. And then you get to this great sign that roughly translates as welcome to hell. And it takes you on a walking tour. And I'm going to say that this is a moderate level hike because I've gone lots of places with my little kids. This is a little bit too much for them. Um, it's mostly because there are a bunch of areas that you have to access by climbing up iron ladders that are fixed to rocks. So you want to make sure that you have good walking shoes and you probably don't want to go with children who are too young. But what do you get when you go there? You get this amazingly beautiful hike through the woods. Whereas it gets the name um, Hell Gorge is maybe a little bit melodramatic. I wanted some good story about devils. I uh, asked some locals, they said it's just because in winter it's a kind of lonely, creepy, gloomy place. Um, Unless you're an ice climber, because ice climbers love to go there in order to climb the frozen waterfalls. So the big attraction is that there are seven waterfalls that the path leads you past. Some are as little as three meters tall. One is 29 meters tall. So they're all different sizes. The sign at the front said you only get five waterfalls, but I counted seven. So we've got a little bonus in there. And then when you finish this wonderful walk, you can head over to Gustiste Peko, the atmospherically named Hell Inn for some strudel and maybe some blueberry schnapps uh, to celebrate the fact that you have to drive back to Ljubljana through the town of Blueberry. Only a short drive from hell, you can find Mayer's Cave or Županova Yama. This is one of many caves you can find in Slovenia. It's really a land dotted by caves underneath everywhere you step, particularly in the karst region. So karst is a word for limestone, and limestone is a porous stone they can get eroded through exposure to water. What this means is that much of what you walk upon, if you're wandering around, particularly the Karst, which is the you know southwestern region of Slovenia, has this network like honeycomb of caves underground. There's some really big famous ones I'm sure you've heard of, but if you did a little Google search about what to see in Slovenia, you have Ostojna Cave and Skotsian Cave, which is the one that I like best. But those are much more visited. There are a lot of caves that are still significant, really impressive, but just not on most tourist paths. And one of them is Mayer's Cave. The site was discovered in 1926 based on the name. You probably guessed it. It was discovered by the mayor at the time, a guy named Josep Perme. There was one chamber of it that had been used as ice storage for a very long time. That was all people knew until he explored it. And he found six further chambers. So... It's really deep. It's, it's hard to explain how deep it is, but first you have to get there. You have to walk down exactly 428 stairs and then a 600 meter long corridor. And then you get to the chambers. So the first one is 122 meters deep, or rather the largest one is that deep and 330 meters long. It's really impressive in size and it surprises you because you're not expecting it. So this is one of the places that you can go that is definitely off the beaten track. If you're interested in spelunking or cave exploration, this is one you'll need to do with a guide for safety. But it's something that, you know, most Slovenes will have not seen, much less tourists. So you will be opening new paths of discovery. Slovenia is gorgeous. 
see what I did there. That's uh, I can't take credit for that one. That one I stole from the town of Ithaca, New York, which is famous for being the location of Cornell University. I remember there was this T-shirt that they printed, I think, in the late 1980s that said, Ithaca is Gorge Us, with Gorge written in all caps. And well, we could steal it for Slovenia because Slovenia has some gorgeous gorges. And while there are some very famous ones, there's one that might be a little bit outside of your radar. And it's the one I'd like to point you to. It's called Ishki Vintka or Ig Gorge. So Ig, that sounds like a cute word, right? It sounds like a sort of Star Wars character who makes beeping noises. In fact, it's the name of a town that I briefly lived in. One of my claims to fame is having lived in Ig, which is probably the cutest name of a town uh, I've ever heard. It's spelled I-G. And near Ig, there is this gorge or Vintka in Slovenian that runs along the Ishka River, and it's called Ishki Vintka. Now, when I'm supposed to write about things like walking in nature and a gorge, it's a little bit of a thankless task for a writer because there are only so many ways you can say, you know, it's really beautiful nature trees, la la la. But you, you got to trust me on this. It's completely beautiful. And all these places I'm sending you to are stunning. Um, me trying to get this across with adjectives probably isn't going to be the most interesting thing for you to listen to, but it is very beautiful. And on these walks, like this one in particular, you can spot all sorts of alpine plants. And as soon as you get into the world of spotting flora, then walks become a degree more engaging because you're not just walking for exercise and getting the fresh air. You can also start to read the landscape and see some of the plants and trees and bushes and know what they are and maybe even know what they're used for if you have any interest in you know, foraging um, or the medicinal use of wild plants. So this is something that I'm interested in, by no means an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I really like to go with people who are. So I've been told that you can spot two flower violets and spring snowflakes, and even the indigenous carniole and primrose. These are all plants that you can find on the path along Ishki Vintgar. The hike is about an hour long, and one of the cool things, if you're into history as I am, is it takes you past one of a handful of partisan secret hospitals that were built by the Yugoslav partisans during World War II to care for the wounded while they were chasing the Nazis out of Slovenia. And this one was built in April of 1942. It was renovated in 1966 as a sort of living museum. And it's a very cool thing to be wandering through the spectacular woods, keeping your eye out for carnival and primrose, and then you stumble on this piece of history right in the middle of the forest. This episode is probably going to make it seem like Ig is the center of the universe, but for our purposes, well, today it is. On the other side of Ig, you'll find Morostig House, a series of pile dwellings that stand above the still waters of the Ljubljana marshes. So if you head out of Ljubljana towards Varje, which is the marsh region, you're going to get to a causeway. Cross the causeway and you're in the town of Ig. And that marsh area was home for some of the earliest settlers to the region that's now Slovenia. We're talking back to the Neolithic and Bronze Age, so 4,000 to 1,000 BC. And these pile dwelling communities basically built houses that were on pylons. So a pylon is essentially a tree trunk, sometimes coated in resin or tar to make it water resistant. And you build your house on top of it. And it was a good idea strategically. So marshes used to be much more wet and impenetrable than they are today. Today, you would hardly know that it's a marsh that you're in. It just looks like scrub. But back in the day, they were quite wet. Um, not Florida Everglades wet, but, but something like that. And so the benefit of having your house on stilts is if the water levels rise, it's not really a problem. Um, it's good for keeping away predators. Um, good for maybe defending against other grumpy humans who might want to steal your goods. And so there were communities that developed here. Um, and this Morostik house is a relatively new endeavor that was set up in order to have a living museum that allows you to see how the pile dwellers used to live. So most people visiting it, honestly, are going to be school groups, but it's great for tourists, just tourists tend not to know about it. 
So what you can visit here, there are five huts that were built in the exact style and technique and manner of the prehistoric inhabitants of the marsh. And you can see what it was like to live there. You'll also find a special boat called a drevak. It's like a wooden dugout canoe, but it's made of two trees and has a flat bottom, which allows the boatman driving it to stand up and be balanced while they're driving the boat. And they were propelled using this wooden pole that you push against the marsh floor. Now, word to the wise, when I was a student in England, I used to go punting sometimes. And a punt is basically like a modern version of a back boat. It's flat bottomed. And you stand at the back and you push it with a long wooden pole, not an oar. And so next time you're driving a Dravak, I'm not sure that's going to happen. But just in case, let's say you need a high-speed getaway and your only manner of escape is a Dravak boat. Make sure when you push the pole, you twist as you pull it out. Because this happened to me once. I pushed the pole in while punting in England. And the pole got stuck in the silt floor of the river. And I held on to it and tried to pull it out. And the boat kept on going. And I was holding on to the pole. And one time, the boat slipped away from me. And I was left holding onto the pole above the water like a cartoon character. I don't think that's going to happen to you while visiting this place. But it certainly is worth visiting. Um, it's on the UNESCO World Heritage List. It has been since 2011. And if you're interested in how people lived, you know, literally many thousands of years ago. This is a great place to visit, and you're probably going to be the only tourist there. So it's a really good way to get to know this rich natural and archaeological zone around Ig without getting your feet wet. By this time, you probably had enough of all this healthy, beautiful nature, right? You want something man-made and old and a little bit musty. Well, we got you covered there, too, because I love visiting churches and monasteries. And I'm going to send you now to a very famous, important monastery called Stichna. So Stichna Monastery is just outside of the Ljubljana Ring Road. It's really easy to get to, but it was a very important place dating back to the Middle Ages. It was founded in 1136 by the Patriarch of Aquileia. Um, and it's been an important center for trade, for the gathering of wisdom, for record keeping. Um, you know, monasteries were the place where books were kept when nobody had books at home, when books had to be hand copied, and they were very rare, precious things. And one of the things that the Cistercian monks who founded and still run this monastery were renowned for was their extensive library. And the most famous thing that's housed there are called the Stichna Manuscripts. This is a collection of medieval manuscripts from the 12th and 13th centuries. And some of them are theological or philosophical. Others are legal documents and historical chronicles, but they are a rich archive for historians to know, you know, what life was like back then. They're also very interesting because they're linguistically diverse. So what do we mean by that? Most of the time, the language of record keeping in the Middle Ages and monasteries was Latin. And some of these texts are in Latin, but there are sections written in some other languages, including Old Church Slavonic and even traces of an old Slovene language. These are languages that have effectively died out. They were used briefly. Each one is an interesting story unto itself, but the very fact that these same manuscripts are written in several languages was interesting. It shows that there's you know, an inter interconnectedness, that's a hard word to say, in medieval Europe um, linguistically, um, as well as culturally, and that you know, is gathered in these bastions of wisdom um, and, and record keeping, which were medieval monasteries. It's also good from a tourist perspective because this is where you can find the Slovenian Museum of Religion. Now, whether or not you're religious, this can be completely fascinating. Um, for me as an art historian, I'm all about religious history because so much of it becomes illustrated in the sort of art that I like to study. So this museum is really good. It displays religious artifacts, manuscripts, and artwork and um, it gives you a sort of one-stop shopping to learn about everything there is to know about the story of organized religion in Slovenia. Now, this might sound kind of funny to you, but one of the highlights of a visit here is to go to the gift shop. How exciting can a museum be if your favorite thing is the gift shop? Well, it's not my favorite thing. I mean, I really enjoyed going on a guided tour. I recommend a guided tour because they show you things you can't normally access. For example, they take you up to the belfry 
And believe it or not, there were bats there. You heard the phrase bats in your belfry. Well, it, there are bats in the belfry there. Um, we had them swooping around us in a, in a not unpleasant way. <laughs> we thought it was quite exciting when we went up there. And we were also shown some cool stuff that's not, I think, on the normal tourist path. Like there was a storage room where recently archaeologists had opened the floor and found a collection of skeletons that nobody had known about. And they were trying to identify who was actually buried there and why. Um, so this kind of stuff is very cool. And you really only get it if you do an organized tour. But back to the gift shop, right? So this might sound funny, but the Stichna Monastery is known throughout Slovenia for some naturalist products that were made based on the recipes of a beloved monk named Father Simon Ashi. Simon was a renowned herbalist, and he would heal people who came to the monastery. And his recipes for the things he would give to people that they found so beneficial were preserved, and you can buy them at the gift shop, but you can also buy some of the products in national supermarkets. I'm thinking of apple cider vinegar, honey, and various tea mixtures, and which herbs are put in the tea, depending on what you want to treat. So these are all things that most Slovenes will have seen at the supermarket, but this is ground zero, and you can get all sorts of things that are beneficial to your health. And if you buy them, they support the upkeep of the monastery. So it's a perfect thing for a souvenir or a gift. So you find yourself in Ljubljana. You're so close to so many fascinating day trips that maybe you should even extend your stay. Whether you're interested in nature or man-made monuments or healing teas, uh, Ljubljana really is a perfect base from which to explore central Slovenia. This has been an episode of the Beyond Ljubljana podcast, brought to you by Ljubljana Tourism.